Hi and welcome to a RetroNAS installation and overview video. In this video we'll be installing RetroNAS on an existing Raspberry Pi from a computer with an SSH connection. Uh, you can do this to any existing Raspberry Pi with a modern Raspberry Pi OS install uh, from any computer that supports SSH or directly from your Raspberry Pi. RetroNAS is a small tool uh, that's a collection of uh, scripts and menus that will help you install legacy file systems, legacy network tools, um, and a lot of useful things that will help old computers and old video game consoles access newer networked features. Um, I've got the project here on my GitHub, uh, and one of the important things I just want to illustrate before I start is the security warning section. RetroNAS, uh, by its nature, uh, offers a lot of older protocols. A lot of these things have been deprecated over time, mostly due to security warnings. Um, a lot of them do things like uh, send username and password information in clear text, i.e. there's no encryption whatsoever. So just important to remember that. Um, if you're using RetroNAS in your home, make sure it's behind your uh, home firewall. Don't put it uh, out on the internet where uh, internet traffic can hit it. Um, and uh, if, you're, if you're running this in a uh, museum or some sort of public access system, definitely consider uh, putting it on a separate isolated network away from your production network um, and using uh, a completely separate set of systems for this just because of the security concerns of it. Um, but with that in mind, we'll go ahead and install uh, RetroNAS. Now, uh, the wiki on the GitHub contains information on how to install it. You can click on this how to link here, which will take you to this wiki link down here, or uh, just use the, the GitHub navigation to go to the wiki. So the landing page for the wiki uh, will include a couple of links, including some supported hardware. Uh, you can install this really on any Raspberry Pi, although I do recommend a newer model, particularly the three and the four models of Raspberry Pis. Uh, mostly around the Ethernet speeds, but also for the Raspberry Pi 4, uh, it includes USB 3 support. So USB 3 has got a lot of advantages over 2. Um, not only is it a whole lot faster, uh, it is uh, full duplex as well, which means it can read and write information back and forth at the same time, rather than the USB 2 protocol, which is only single duplex. Uh, and that makes a big difference if you have uh, USB hosted storage hanging off your Raspberry Pi for RetroNAS. I'll have a video on how to manage storage completely separate to this. Um, also the speed, uh, the Raspberry Pi 4 is a lot faster, although honestly if you're setting this up for some really old computers, um, they probably won't notice. Uh, anywho, if we go back to the installer, uh, it has some uh, guides here on how to install it which we'll follow, we'll get on a, on a Raspberry Pi and we'll follow this ourselves. Uh, and just another warning, this uh, installer asks you to go and grab a script off the internet and run it as the admin or root user of a Linux system. Um, generally that's a pretty scary thing to do, so I do offer people uh, all of my source code here on GitHub. Uh, you can browse through all of the code here and see what it does, including the installer. Um, so if you have any sort of trust issues over what I'm doing with these scripts, definitely check that out. Uh, it's a good way to make sure that this isn't going to do anything nasty to your system. But with that in mind, let's get on with the install. So I'm just going to SSH over to my Raspberry Pi. Uh, now I have set the password for my Raspberry Pi uh, as just Pi, same as the username. Uh, I recommend you uh, do something a little bit better than that. Uh, however, for the purposes of all these demos, I'm going to keep it really simple. Username Pi, password Pi. I'm just going to copy this line here. And that's going to download uh, the installer script and put it on the Raspberry Pi. So there it is. We're going to make it executable. And we're going to run it. Now we'll run it with the uh, sudo command at the front here. 
Um, that's because we want to run it as the root user or the, or the privileged user to ensure that it can make changes to our Raspberry Pi system. Now the first thing this is going to do is go out to the internet, um, update your packages on your Raspberry Pi. Um, I've got a local package cache on my network, which is why you see these funny addresses here, but it'll update your Raspberry Pi from whatever uh, repositories you've set up. The second thing it'll do uh, is grab a bunch of tools that it needs to actually install uh, RetroNAS. So the big one that RetroNAS uses is a tool called Ansible. Um, and you can see these in the source. If I just go back to the wiki here, uh, you can see all these Ansible tools here and we'll be uh, setting up these in, in videos to come. Um, but they're essentially just instructions that tell the Ansible system how to install different packages and configure them uh, on your uh, Raspberry Pi. So that's what this is going to do. Now, this can take a little while um, on the very first install. After this, when we actually run RetroNAS, it'll be a little bit faster. Um, however, the actual install of Ansible itself is quite heavyweight. Um, it's quite a complex tool. Uh, it's not very big in size in terms of actual uh, megabytes of stuff installed. Um, however, it does take a little while to install, mostly because of the uh, slow speed of the Raspberry Pi. So we'll just let that run through. Okay, now we have uh, RetroNAS installed and we can run it. Uh, again, we want to prefix it with the uh, sudo command here, uh, which will allow us to run it as the, the root user in order to make changes to the system. So on each run, uh, it will just update your package cache again, which should be uh, fairly quick. It's not going to do a full install, so we won't have uh, the big wait like we did with the Ansible install. Uh, and then it'll ask you about the terminal encoding that you want to use. Um, so if you just press uh, enter on your keyboard, it'll just keep whatever the default one is that you're currently using. Um, if you've got a legacy retro computer uh, that you want to use RetroNAS through, um, the VT100 encoding, which is option two, is the best. Uh, and I'll demonstrate that later. I'll do a video on uh, Telnet from, a, from an older operating system and you can see the difference uh, between the two. One, one kind of looks good and one looks pretty messed up. Um, so we'll just go with the default now. So um, you can either just uh, put, it, put in number one, which is the default, or just press return, either option, and that will take you into this main menu. Now one of the important things to keep note of here uh, is your IP address. It'll print this at the top of the RetroNAS menu. Um, yours will be different to mine, obviously, because it'll be your home network or your whatever network you've set this up on. Um, now, uh, you can install RetroNAS itself, obviously, from a, uh, a direct attached keyboard and monitor on your actual Raspberry Pi, uh, or you can install it over SSH like I've done here. Um, but either way, it should show your IP address if you're connected into a network, which you'll definitely want to do uh, because this is a network system. Uh, and from here, uh, we've got a couple of different options we can look at. Our global configuration uh, includes uh, the ability to change the user that RetroNAS runs as. So by default, it runs as the Pi user, um, which is the default for a Raspberry Pi. Uh, however, if you've got a different system, if you've set this up on a, uh, a Linux uh, desktop or computer or something like that, uh, and you want to change that user, you can do that here. The RetroNAS password section, you can run that if you want to change the uh, password of the configured user that you've got, uh, and it will also uh, do things like change the SMB password. So I'll do SMB CIFS, which is a, uh, a network access protocol popular in uh, Windows and Mac computers, but it can also be used for things like uh, PlayStation 2s, uh, and use, setting the username and password, uh, you can do that through there. The RetroNAS top level directory, uh, by default it just points to this data RetroNAS directory. Uh, you can change it to anything you like. Uh, and I'll have a separate video uh, entirely dedicated to managing storage, including how you can manage uh, USB attached storage, local storage, um, and then how you can um, format that to different file systems, which you may need for special tools, um, particularly things like EtherDFS, which is a 
DOS file system, which requires a special file system, and I'll, I'll go through that in a separate video. And then there's a fix, fix on disk permissions uh, entry here. So for any reason, the uh, on disk permissions get messed up. Um, so if you've done something as root uh, and it's added some weird permissions into your tree, you can use that option to fix that up from this menu. So next is the install things menu. And this is where you can actually uh, install the different services that uh, RetroNAS has on offer. Um, so I'm hoping to add a lot more things into the future. However, uh, at the moment I've got a few, I'll just run through these for you. Uh, the first one is Samba, which is an SMB or CIFS uh, file sharing system. Uh, and the configuration I've put together in RetroNAS includes legacy protocols that uh, Samba supports, such as Landman, NetBIOS, NetBUI, NTLM, all those sorts of things. Um, so you can connect some really old computers to this um, compared to a standard uh, NAS, which might only allow newer sort of Windows 7 uh, and up computers to connect due to security concerns of older protocols. The next on the list is NetATalk, which is an Apple Talk. Uh, protocol for Linux. Um, this particular NetATalk is NetATalk 3, so it only supports uh, AFP file sharing over TCP. Uh, in the future I will try and get an older version of NetATalk 2 installed as well as an option. Um, that'll allow EtherTalk and AppleTalk um, directly over non-TCP links, but I'll need some hardware to test that, so that'll come into the future. EtherDFS is a lightweight uh, layer 2 file sharing system for MS-DOS, so it doesn't use TCP. Um, as a result, EtherDFS really needs uh, wired Ethernet, definitely won't work over wireless, or it might, but uh, it's pretty patchy, so wired Ethernet is definitely advised, and likewise it's advised to have your uh, Raspberry Pi on the same physical network as your MS-DOS machine, or, or just use a crossover cable, that works too. Um, however, it's an excellent file system. It does require a FAT formatted storage device to be attached to your Raspberry Pi. Uh, and again, I'll go through how to set that up uh, in a future video. Uh, Lighty uh, is a web server, uh, so similar to Apache or Nginx, uh, and it just serves uh, the entire tree that you've exported from RetroNAS as, as HTTP. So you can, so it's not writable, you can't uh, push information to it, but you can read information from it. So if you've got a legacy operating system, uh, it can be something like uh, uh, MS-DOS or an Amiga, Atari ST, something with a basic web browser that can browse HTTP, uh, you can definitely browse the contents of your RetroNAS and download information to it via a web browser. ProFTPD is a, just a standard FTP file transfer uh, daemon, a uh, pretty popular file transfer system even today, unfortunately it shouldn't be because it's not encrypted, um, however it does get used a lot, but FTP clients are certainly pretty popular for a lot of computers uh, and also uh, other systems, non-computer systems use uh, FTP to push information around. So this is an FTP server, if you've got an FTP client on your uh, system, you can connect in and you can grab all your files. TFTP is a, uh, a trivial file transfer protocol, different to FTP, uh, much lighter weight. Um, however, there are a lot of TFTP clients around for different older file systems and it can be really useful just to be able to uh, pull information over via that. SSH is the secure shell um, system and it also supports file copy. Uh, so if you've got SSH to any device uh, and an SSH client on the client side, uh, you can use SFTP and SCP through SSH and that'll allow you to push and pull files back and forth uh, using that protocol. Telnet is a remote access uh, protocol similar to OpenSSH except completely unencrypted. Um, came bundled with a lot of older systems, especially around the, the 90s in the early internet days. Um, and I'll do a separate video on that, uh, showing how to use that from older systems. Uh, this is a tool for Nintendo 3DS. Uh, if you've got a Nintendo 3DS and you've modded it with Homebrew uh, and you have the FBI Homebrew installer tool, um, you can actually use your Nintendo 3DS camera to scan a QR code to get the uh, network location of a CIA file that you might want to install on your Nintendo 3DS. 
Um, so I'll do a separate video on that. That tool will enable uh, automatic generation of the QR codes for any information you've got sitting on RetroNAS um, and make it a lot easier to install those uh, tools. Uh, if you have a PlayStation 2 uh, and you're running OpenPS2 loader on it, um, which you need to do via things like um, free McBoot or uh, a, a mod chip or something like that. But if you've got that running, uh, that can mount games uh, over the network using the SMB protocol. However, it needs some specific uh, directory setup for that to work. So this option uh, will not only install Samba, uh, option two above, but it'll also configure it specifically for uh, OpenPS2 loader. Um, and one of the uh, the requirements for that is to have a PlayStation 2 with a network adapter. So if you've got a uh, fat PlayStation 2, you'll need a um, an official Sony network adapter. The third party ones tend not to actually have the network component activated. They're just a disk system. Um, but if you've got a slim PlayStation 2, they come with a network adapter built in. So they're super useful. They'll work without any extra hardware modifications or changes, um, as long as you can run free McBoot and open PS2 loader on them. Uh, PS3 Net Server is a tool that will allow streaming of PlayStation 3 games from your storage to a PlayStation 3 console. You'll need that console running um, some sort of uh, custom firmware or um, homebrew enabler um, and the webman mod tools. Uh, however, uh, it lets you um, not have to install games directly on your PS3 and you can just run them over the network from your retro NAS. Mr. FPGA is an excellent um, emulation simulation, some debate on, on what it's called. Um, I, I think it's emulation, I call it an emulation device um, using FPGA technology. Um, it's an excellent way to experience uh, very low latency, low lag, very, very accurate um, older style games from that 8 and 16 bit era. Uh, and now even there's cores coming out pushing into sort of PlayStation 1, which is really cool. Uh, however, in order to access uh, any of your ROMs or disk images or uh, anything that you've got stored on your NAS, uh, you need a specific file system set up. So uh, this option here will not only configure Samba in option two, but again, it'll create a custom layout specific for Mister that you can drop files into. So you can drop them in from another network computer, from like a Windows or a, or a you know Mac, some other um, network connected system on your network. Drop those ROMs into this device and then have them ready for Mister to pick up and use. SyncThing is a uh, private file synchronization tool. You can uh, synchronize large amounts of files with friends. Uh, and it'll do that securely. It'll encrypt it, um, the transmission over the network uh, and out over the internet. So uh, similar to like a cloud file sharing service, uh, except not using any third party cloud vendors. It's, it's totally private. Uh, it's just a private connection between you and somebody else. Uh, and you can synchronize a number of files, which might be useful if you've got some cool stuff on your retro NAS that you want to share with friends. And finally, Cockpit, which is a, uh, an open source web-based management tool for Linux. Uh, and I'll do a, a large video on this, mostly around storage management, because uh, this has got some great um, GUI tools that you can use to format storage, connect storage to your uh, RetroNAS or Raspberry Pi, uh, and make sure it's available for any other device in your uh, network to be able to pick up off RetroNAS and load as its main storage. Um, and I'll, I might do a couple of videos on that, some basic storage where we just plug in like a USB flash drive or something like that. And then maybe some more adma advanced ones where we look at um, some RAID or some redundant storage, something a little bit faster that can take advantage of the USB 3 speeds that are on offer on something like a Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Web1. Web1 is a very interesting project. It's a proxy server for uh, older systems. So if you have a web browser and that web browser wants to get to the internet, uh, you can create a proxy that sits in the middle. So a computer that sits between your web browser and the internet and allows your uh, computer to bounce through that device to get to the internet. Uh, Web1 goes one step further, so normally a proxy will do things like cache content or um, allow you access around firewalls or things like that. 
Web1 sits in the middle and will modify traffic that goes back and forth to the internet and make it compatible with older web browsers. So if you've got an old web browser, say you've got like a Mac OS 8, OS 9 computer, Windows 95 computer, something that's got a very old web browser that can't uh, access modern websites, either because they're full of um, CSS or JavaScript or potentially they're using a stronger encryption model that your old browser can't use. Web1 converts that information in the middle uh, and makes it really accessible from old computers to get out to the internet. Uh, obviously some security concerns about that, don't go doing your net banking or something silly like that. Um, however, it's a really great way to go and get particularly old games and old software off places like archive.org download them to your old computer. So I'll have a completely separate video on that showing how to set that up and how to use it for a couple of different operating systems. And finally on to check services. Uh, so this simply checks things that have been installed. Uh, this is a brand new install obviously so I don't have much installed. Uh, however OpenSSH was installed via the uh, Raspberry Pi setup and something I did uh, in order to access my Raspberry Pi so I can check that one. Uh, for example it will tell me that uh, it's running. Um, but if you have any other um, tools that are installed and you just want to see the status of them, uh, either uh, a, check that they're working, or uh, B, maybe see some basic log output or something like that. You can do that from here. Um, I'll try and have some uh, better options in the future about some more advanced log checking, but for now that uh, will at least tell you whether things are running or not. So that's RetroNAS in a nutshell. Um, I'll have a bunch of videos, like I said, uh, into the future on how to install each of those items. Uh, and then I'm hoping also to have some extra videos on top that do things like taking you through a particular legacy operating system uh, and the things you can do with RetroNAS based on that legacy op operating system. So things like real MS-DOS machines, real Mac OS uh, 9 machines, uh, some real Windows 95 machines, uh, and maybe I'll try some uh, emulated Amiga and Atari ST. It's not stuff I have uh, myself that I can access, but they're things that I can maybe put in an emulator and maybe get working and demonstrate. Um, for now, that's the install video and a bit of an introduction. Uh, I hope you have some fun retro computing and retro as is useful to you. Thanks a lot.